This episode of the After Action Review Podcast is brought to you by the Java Can, an all-in-one ruggedized coffee brewing system designed by a green beret so that you can make a fresh cup of coffee anywhere from your backyard to a mountaintop in Afghanistan. The Java Can will brew you and your team a fresh cup of coffee no matter where life takes you. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. That's thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, get your 10% off. Live life charged. Action Review with Rod Rodriguez. All right, welcome to the After Action Review. I am Rod Rodriguez, of course, your host. And Happy New Year. It's 2019. Well, it's actually, I'm not going to lie. Uh, you know, of course, some things are pre all, all things are pre recorded. So it's still 2018. In fact, it's not even Christmas yet. But for the sake of this recording, I want you folks listening in your car, working out in the gym, watching us on YouTube. Just pretend like I, I like it's in 2019 for me. So happy new year. I hope everyone had a great new year, safe, sound, no issues with all that uh, uh, new year's festivities. And it is a new year and it's going to be a new year for me, but it's a new year for you. And of course, everyone's making or made their new year's resolutions, uh, new me, uh, all this wonderful stuff. I'm sure I will be plagued by the numerous uh, New Year, New Me Facebook posts. But just remember, uh, some things don't change. And some of those things that don't change are the uh, the soldiers that are deployed. There's always the families who are here supporting them. And just remember that it, it is a new year. Uh, 2019 is going to be, uh, it's going to be a very controversial year if you're in the, pol and if you're, if you're interested in the political realm, uh, it's already an interesting, uh, year for us. It's, it's 2018 still for, uh, you know, during this recording. In fact, I can tell you that this is being, being recorded the day after General Mattis resigned. So the world right now is a buzz. So if you're, you know, as you're listening to this in 2019, um, think back when the news hit you, when you saw it on, on Facebook, that's what we're in the middle of right now. Luckily, this is not a political show, so we don't get too far into that, but I will say this, um, I'm a big fan of General Mattis. I, I was very happy when he became the secretary of defense. Uh, I was very proud to have such a representative of the military and, and I'm an army guy. So for me to be, you know, ecstatic about seeing a Marine general in, in that position. Um, but honestly, you know, we have some great leaders in the army. We have some great leaders in every branch, but general Mattis certainly stood out from the pack. Um, his, his forwardness, his professionalism, his willingness to kill everyone in sight. Um, God bless that man. God bless what he does. But, um, He's on his way out and he'll be out in February, I believe February 28th, the last day of February should be his last day. So um, as you're listening to this, General Mattis is still in office. He's still in his position, still doing his thing. And as he exits, um, and I'll probably talk about this again in another episode as we get closer to that time. Uh, these are just my, my um, immediate reflections on it. Um, I think that we should be weary and cautious anytime a leader of his wisdom, of his leadership, of his candor, anytime somebody of his caliber decides to leave an endeavor they chose to do, nobody forced him to do it. He chose to take on the office of the Secretary of Defense. Anytime we have somebody that prestigious decide to leave suddenly or decide that this isn't what I want to be doing. I think that we as American citizens, left, right, middle, doesn't matter. I think that should give us pause. I think those moments should give us uh, an indicator 
that we should maybe stop and reevaluate what's going on. This is literally, um, yeah, yeah. I think I'll leave it at that. Let's just, let's all take a pause and take a look around and go, what's going right? What's going wrong? Maybe, maybe that's what the country needs. We need an AAR. We need an after action review. We need to stop and go, okay, how long has it been? 200 and something years. Where are we at? What have we done right? Oh, we did some of those things right. We did some of those things wrong. Uh, what can we do better next time? And I wish elections were AARs, but they're not. Elections are becoming fiascos and and uh, and circuses. And I don't like circus. I don't like clowns in general. But let's get off of that. All right. So where am I? What are we doing? You probably see the uh, the clear combo. Uh, piece right here. This is not just me. And if you're listening, obviously you can't see it, but I have the clear camo uh, soundboard up here. It's a sound panel and absorbs some of the noise and some of the echo that that is occurring in here. Um, it is not just blatant advertisement, although it is blatant advertisement on my piece because that's my company as well. But anyways, um, this is a really special episode for me. I'm really excited about this because uh, I am a huge fan of of dogs. I've had dogs my entire life and I have a dog. I have two dogs now. I have a, a giant Mastiff uh, lab mix at home that is a hundred pound baby. I have this little old dog. Uh, her name is Zoe and she's, she's tiny and old and fragile and she's cranky all the time. She's, she is the very epitome of little old lady. Um, and I, you know, I love dogs, but I've seen a, a, I don't want to say a rash, but I would say a influx of service dogs, which has made me kind of curious. Like what is a service dog? Where do they come from? Um, you know, what other service animals can, you know, you probably heard like there was a, uh, a lady that was kicked off a flight because she, they wouldn't let her get on board with her service peacock. Like who the fuck brings a peacock onto a flight? But anyways, I am here at the headquarters of Semper Canine, and I have my amazing guest here. He is the uh, CEO, uh, the founder. Uh, this is a nonprofit, so he is the uh, founder of Semper Canine. And uh, tell us what is Semper Canine, and tell us who you are. And first of all, you know, thanks for having me on the show today. It was uh, uh, more than exciting to be able to come out here and and talk about what we do and talk about our mission. But of course, I'm always interested in the veteran community. And I'm at the point in in my life, uh, like as you were talking with the, the the political side of it, I'm at that point in my life where I need to be, I'm learning to be more and more involved with what's going on in, in our country as well as what's going on in my local community. And and I commend you for providing an outlet like that for the for the the veterans out there listening as well as you know anyone who's interested in you know what's going on in in our world. Uh, but uh, I guess the nitty gritty of it is. Uh, uh, I was a military working dog handler. I joined the Marine Corps straight after high school, um, you know, with the intention of being a working dog handler. That was uh, my interest is growing up, you know, the kind of the why I do what I do now. Uh, I've always loved teaching and animals and those kind of ran hand in hand with teaching a dog to uh, to do something extraordinary as the things military working dogs do. But you know, I did that for eight years active duty um, and got out in 2009 and still followed the dog world and still did mil uh, did military contracts uh, with a military working dog and a co or a contract working dog. And uh, I was given the opportunity by the Semper Fi Fund. Uh, for those who are listening, probably one of my favorite nonprofits that's not Semper K-9. Uh, but they they also uh, have the America's Fund, which is you know runs in tandem with working with all military branches, not just the Marine Corps. Um, but they provided an opportunity for me to take the skills I learned from the military and and my uh, dog world, my dog training uh, experience outside of the military, and can I take that that experience and redirect it towards training service dogs for injured veterans? Um, and essentially, it turned into uh, a pilot program for training rescue dogs to be different types of service dogs for different types of injured veterans. And eventually we added uh, family members in there as well. So we try to cover uh, uh, the entire military, you know, family. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, uh, it really comes down to, you know, when we first started Semper K-9 to just, you know, finding out where the need was uh, within the community, um, specifically our disabled veteran community. 
And then what kind of resources do we have access to to be able to, you know, make their life a little bit better? Uh, and then when we were after the pilot program, we we deemed that we could, you know, make this a feasible uh, nonprofit and a feasible uh, and a successful organization. Coming up with a mission, um, and I think that's where. You know, that's where it really hits home for me. Um, you know, we were finalizing how we were going to, you know, run the organization. We were submitting our, you know, 99, or excuse me, submitting our incorporation, submitting our determination to the IRS was coming up with a mission that, that still stands, you know, still stands today and and hopefully, uh, you know, resonates with anybody who does any research on us, anyone who's, you know, any veteran that's applying for a service dog. I think every business should be judged on what is their mission statement. And ours is simply, you know, Semper Canine uh, mission is to enhance the quality of life of injured service members and their families by providing an assistance dog. What What is a service dog exactly? I mean, it, what defines like the difference between, I guess, I train my dog to be resourceful um, compared to, this dog is a certified training dog or a certified uh, assistance dog. So Department of Justice is, is the governing body that defines a service dog and specifically one that governs um, and mandates the, the Department of Justice. Yes. Wow. I did not know it went up that high. Yeah. It, I mean, it's the very the very top line of uh, of the Amer- American with Disability Act is Department of Justice. That's true. Um, so, but they're, so they're their governing body. They're they're the ones that are you know because there's a legal side to it. Um, you know, we're talking about protecting the rights of disabled Americans. You know, against any kind of you know uh, unfair or e- unequal treatment, regardless of you know age, race, or mm-hmm. specifically their disability. Um, but uh, the debate really comes down to defining a service dog, um, and I think um, in layman's terms. Uh, and, I, and I'll go into a little more detail about this, but layman's term is it has to be a dog and or a miniature horse, uh, and they have to be speci- specifically or individually trained to perform work or tasks for someone with a disability or an American with a disability. That's the kind of nitty and gritty of it, you know. So a horse, a mini miniature horse, can be a miniature horse, yes. miniature horse or a dog. Yes, I and noticed you didn't say peacock. No, no peacock, and and incidentally enough that. That service, you know, if those who can't those hear my those air, are quotation quotes, marks, yes, <laughs> uh, had an identification card. Mm-hmm. That dog, uh, or excuse me, that peacock, you know, was registered in some for-profit organization's database, uh, and the dog was, uh, excuse me, lack of using peacock so much in the industry. <laughs> How often uh, do we use a peacock yeah, in exactly. any conversation? That animal, <laughs> that animal uh, yes. had an, an official ID card, um, and I believe it was. I forget the the organization, not to, to call them out, but one of those, if you haven't seen it before, you know, just say online registry. Um, hmm. And I, I pick fun at the medicinal marijuana world, you know, because, you know, for, for lack of a, you know, a better comparison, you know, it's, you know, people in those medicinal, uh, you know, accepted states where you can get a card for almost any disability. I've got glycoma, I've got, you know, bad back. And, and unfortunately the, service dog world uh, or industry has been kind of labeled, um, at least from the outside in, has been labeled that way. Um, and so that has become quite a problem with uh, the public, you know, understanding what what is the definition of a service animal and whether those those animals they run into in public, you know, are you know, legitimate uh, or counterfeit or not. Um, I like to say that Unfortunately, we live in a whistleblower society where everybody wants to be the, everybody wants to be deep throat. Everybody wants to be that person that raised the 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 white flag or the black flag that, you know, shined a spotlight on you know uh, an atrocity. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the downside. Uh, you know, from either side of the, the spectrum, whether you're you know a person of authority challenging a questionable dog, um, or as a user of a service dog, um, you know you're. I, I tell all of our veterans, uh, anyone who's applying for a service dog, anyone that's uh, that's listening that is in the process of receiving a service dog or, or buying a service dog, that the biggest challenge you're going to run into is 
you know, a public perspective. You know, people looking at you and everybody is going to judge you and your dog, whether they know you're blind, uh, whether they can see your, you know, your uh, limitations uh, or, you know, you look like somebody who's scamming because you're, you know, a disabled veteran who maybe has a traumatic brain injury or has severe post-traumatic stress or the common, you know, common person with just generalized anxiety disorder, you know, from a dog training perspective and from the, my, the professional industry side of it, I, when I give speeches or when I have conversations with, with individuals about counterfeit or illegitimate service dogs, I tell them that I don't see fake service dogs very often, mainly because I don't label them. As long as their dog is controllable and unobtrusive to the public, then I just assume, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Until that dog misbehaves in some form or fashion. And even then, as a dog trainer, I'll I'll take it for face value. You know, I have no idea what may have been happened five minutes before that. I have no idea what that, that individual's dog is trained for, as well as what their personal needs are related to the ailments with their disability. So when I see a dog out there, regardless if he's five pound chihuahua or a 800 pound, slightly over, or excuse me, 120 pounds, slightly overweight. I was going to say, what 800 pound <laughs> dog have you seen and where can we kill it? Cause that thing should be around. Yeah. A hundred, you know, plus, you know, slightly overweight dog that may, you know, maybe a little slobby or a little older looking, um, you know, I'm going to just assume that dog is well-trained as long, as long as he doesn't give me any other cause to, to concern. And even in that situation, more than likely, I'm not a person of authority. It's honestly none of my business. You know? Yeah, how do you, how would we even? I mean, it, it kind of goes to like that whole um, the the stolen valor thing, like you know, people running up on veterans, like you're stolen valor. It's like no, no, he's he's legit. He may just look a little weird or a little rough around the edges, but he's he's a legit guy. I don't want to be the person who tries to call out a service dog, and then I find out like no, this is a legit service dog. You just you just don't understand. You're yeah. just not in the know. And also, like to your point. That's not my business. Like until that dog bites somebody or starts growling at my kid. No, now you've made it my business. But otherwise, it's it's just it's it can be indistinguishable. Uh, that is, you know, a service dog from a quote unquote fake service dog. But there have been situations where people will take dogs into places that I'm like, uh, I I don't want to be discriminant. I do, or discriminatory. I don't know what the British what's the right word. I don't want to be a bad person who's like, I'm in the movie theater and you just brought your dog in here. Like, is this dog gonna freak out? And it it I shouldn't be like that, I don't know, judgmental about it. But you look at stuff and you're like, really? Like you're bringing a dog in the movie theater. You're bringing your dog into uh, you know, I don't know, like the grocery store. And it's like, okay, I get it. You you need to a person who's hurt needs that. But uh, again, to your point, some folks don't look like they need it. But I'm not thinking about the general anxiety. I'm not thinking about a lot of the the invisible wounds as they, you know, we people talk about, you know, the invisible trauma that dog could be servicing. So why dogs? Tell me why dogs in general, like why not peacocks? Why not cats? Why not? Sir, why can't I have a service panther? You know, uh, okay, well, maybe not the service panther. I think that was self-explanatory. But why are dogs great for this job? Um, we can go. I, there's a lot of portions of, of what I do that, that involves just the history of, of, you know, beast of burden, you know, for those who are listening and not to be oversensitive to man's best friend. But, you know, dogs are beast of burden. You know, they were. For for uh for the most part, you know, we're um are you know have been part of our lives for you know twenty thirty thousand years, um specifically providing some you know whether it's companionship or and it could be you know um, like I said you know uh, comes to working dogs and herding dogs sheep dogs you know whether it's farms or you know in, any form or fashion uh I think the reason we have service dogs um is specifically you know kind of going going back to the historical side of it helen keller you know I, there are, there are certain people out there that claim they you know they define service dog they produce the first service dog or uh and i think uh, if you're not helen keller then then no and not to say even you know back then uh turn of the century the 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 20s at, at the, the latest you know that term did not really exist um 
But because, you know, she was a pioneer at it and because, you know, the research that these, you know, later organizations came in, came into play and specifically taking someone who has, you know, you know, when you define disability, the inability to perform a daily function, you know, regardless if it's, you know, easily noticeable or invisible um, or, you know, it's something that I, we take for granted, you know, just, you know, like being able to see or hear something behind you. Um, dogs are great at this because they're they're man's best friend. They're really mm-hmm. good at being able to staying staying attuned to, you know, the nuances of, of uh, you know, living in a, in a social, you know, environment. Um, so they're just like linked to us. That, and, uh, to be honest, that really comes down to trainability. Mm-hmm. That dogs are are moldable. You know, even to the point now where we have such a broad range of, you know, sp- specialty bred dogs, or you know, dogs that are bred for a specific purpose. Um, you know, so you can kind of, you know, humans. There's a broad range of temperaments, you know, and types of types of living of of people. And the same thing applies for dogs, you know, uh, you know, someone who's got a, you know, from a service dog standpoint, you know, someone who's got a relaxed lifestyle, you know, has, you know, is low functioning out in public or, you know, but high functioning at home, you know, I can, they can get away with a dog that, you know, doesn't require a lot of care, a lot of, a lot of effort, uh, you know, and is, is just more of a, hey, the dog performs these types of functions uh, based off their handler's needs. Excuse me. Um, but then of course you've got those, those, you know, you know, low functioning, you know, individuals, especially our veterans coming out of, coming out of combat and, you know, they're expected to join the workforce and take care of a family and, and not, you know, not consider their own, um, their own health, you know, and their own, you know, mental state. So, you know, some of those situations we want to provide a dog that's going to give you avenues for either recreational outlets, um, or, you know, something that's going to create a, a mission. Um, uh, I use the term, you know, because we don't give service dogs away. All of our veterans earn their dogs. Um, the dogs are trained and then the veterans go through training as well. And it's essentially the dog that, you know, they're going to get paired with the dog that performs the functions they need, uh, but, you know, is malleable to their lifestyle. What goes into training a dog appropriately for the task of being a service dog? It, it, it honestly, I, I take... That's a really hard question to answer. Uh, that's why I, I asked that. I yeah. wanted to. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, I haven't heard it fr- phrased that way before. Mm-hmm. The, the questions I haven't heard, I haven't been presented with the framework of the question that way. And, and I say that for for Cipro when I'm when I'm selecting dogs or I'm looking for service dog candidates, I'm I'm not trying to change the dog. I ta- I'm looking for behavior that fits with my training style as well as the types of veterans that we have apply. And I'm looking for naturally occurring behavior, dogs that have natural retrieval ability. You know, you know, at four or five, six weeks old, I could throw something or, you know, whether it's a toy or a ball or anything, even a piece of food. And the dog's willing to run and grab it and then either look for something else or come back to you. You know, that's a, a, a simplified um, version. Um, other things, you know, we look for if I make noise distraction, you know, when a puppy's looking off in the distance or whatever, what's their natural response? Do they jump in my lap, which could be a sign of anxiety. Do they, you know, do they uh, investigate the thing that made sounds, which just shows confidence, shows interest. Um, do they free? Is there a freeze response? Is there a, a instantly? And the one thing we don't want to see is a dog that instantly runs back to cover, you know? So I use, you know, obviously my own personal experience in creating, a, you know, a, a selection evaluation. Uh, but honestly, I, I look for dogs that want a job that, you know, when I, I kind of set them up, you know, either it's rescue or the breeder that's, you know, providing a donated dog to us. You know, I set set them up and say, you know, as far removed as a meal from possible in an area they've never been to. And I want to see how they react. All right. Because that's majority of what service dog training is, especially in the beginning, is taking them out, you know, and expecting them to perform in an obedient manner as well as being unobtrusive to the public. But that only makes a service dog in training. You know, I want a dog that, you know, after a year of training, that in that situation and that handler has an emotional outburst, you know, in a, a theme, theme park or in a movie theater, that the dog is still going to perform his duties. You know, he's still going to be, no, this is my job. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is my my battle buddy. This is my partner. I have to get this done. I don't care about that popcorn. I don't care about that screaming kid. You know, so 
when I'm selecting dogs, I'm looking for a dog that's got some drive, got some interest, and, and looks like he wants something to do. And he doesn't want to hang out at a house all day and want people at work. So there's a lot of different organizations out there. So if you go off and you Google um, how to get a service dog, there's a lot of websites or a lot of organizations out there. So you've covered a little bit about what it takes to be a good working dog, to be a good service dog. What's it take to be a good working dog, service dog trainer? Is there a certification that somebody should be on the lookout for? Like if they're not certified by this body, they're, they don't know what you're getting. You don't, you don't know whether or not that person is training that dog accordingly. And then you could end up with like, you know, some psycho dog at your house. Um, I'd say if you're, if you're, and this goes across the dog training industry and it really animal training industry, you know, look for specialties. You know, um, if you're, if you're a, you know, a dog owner and you're looking to train your dog for anything, you know, obviously you can stick with the basics and you can look, hit up your local pet store and, you know, go through their obedience class. Um, you know, and I'm not saying you have to go to a, you know, a high end franchise dog trainer that uses the most expensive equipment possible, but look for end results. Um, you know, us as an organization to, to, we'll take in, you know, we take in rescue puppies that are, you know, eight weeks old and we'll take in donated dogs, uh, from, you know, a breeder that may be four or five, six months old. Um, and as well as we'll take in dogs from the humane society, the local shelters, that as long as the dog's not over two years old, doesn't have any medical problems or anything like that. But when I look at, you know, any type of dog, I want a dog that's going to, at a bare minimum, can can perform as a, an assistance dog, mm -hmm. hence super canine assistance dogs. If I have a dog that can't pass all the tests, you know, and our very, the very first dog that super canine trained couldn't quite finish the end of it. Um, but we were able to career change them. Just like if you're in the military and you can't pass that school or, you know, don't fit well into that, that billet, then we can career change you. We can find a place for you. Right. But what, what about the trainers? I mean, do you guys have to go, is there like a certification body? Is there something that says, I am a certified dog trainer. I know what I'm doing. So the dog that you're getting is going to function as opposed to, you know, Rod Rodriguez off the street. I go pick up a dog at the kennel and I'm like, Hey, you know, at the dog shelter, I'm like, Hey man, throw a vest on it. Service dog. Yeah. You know, what's the difference between those two things? So to be honest, um, you know, time, time and service is, is what I look at, you know, um, you know, I've been training dogs since 2000, you know, but I, I, and I was training dogs before that just for AKC standards, you know, for, for, you know, my family's breeding program. But, so you've been in, you've been in this business a long, through your whole life almost. Uh, yeah, I, as early as I can remember, um, I think I was in fifth grade when we bought land down in central Georgia and, and put up, I think we had eight or 10 pens and we're breeding, I think golden retrievers to start. And then we went into labs and then eventually chocolate labs came into the picture, but we did that for majority of my middle school years. Um, and then they sold, sold the business and, and, uh, and, uh, I moved, we moved up to near Atlanta, um, just a small town. Um, so I made it, but even there, I, you know, we had a personal pet that unfortunately backyard breeding, I we didn't, it wasn't purposeful breeding, mm -hmm. but my dad didn't ever got her, you never got her spayed. So she had a few litters over the years. And so I got the, you know, raised, raised a couple litters of puppies and, and things like that. And, you know, we never sold them. We took them to Walmart and put them in a box, free puppies. By the time we were done shopping, they're gone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously I, I learned the, the not so best way of, uh, of doing it. Um, but even, you know, being in the Marine Corps, you know, you go through, you know, just, just uh, kind of a, a, you know, like a college, uh, you know, program, you know, you learn the basics of animal behavior and, and how to handle the dog. And then you learn and, you know, get into theory, you get a behavior modification, you get, in, uh, the more theory of it as far as uh, positive reinforcement, negative punishment and, and everything in between. Um, and then you get into kennel management and being able, being able to create a program. So if you're looking for a dog trainer, you know, I say, you know, not to give them a plug, but the most acceptable, in my opinion, one of the most well-balanced dog training um, organizations is, is American Kennel Club. You know, as far as, and they have, especially over the last few years, have become really encompassing of all breeds, you know, mixed or not. Um, the Canine Good Citizen 
test has been around for at least 12 years, if not longer than that, probably much longer. Um, and I've seen it evolve. Uh, I've been an evaluator since 2011, I believe. And I've seen it evolve a lot in that period of time where they've gotten into advanced obedience. They've introduced more things that are useful as kind of a testing platform for assistance dog stuff. Um, specifically, their their community canine, their urban canine tests are great you know, pre-test or testing for public access for a dog that's potentially going to become a service dog or a dog that needs to be tested in difficult situations. Um, there aren't any rules specifically to, to what a service dog trainer or organization as far as their credentials go, um, but they should be doing it, um, you know, with some kind of training framework and most accepted is just American Kennel Club, Can I Good Citizen? And there are hundreds and hundreds of evaluators out there and people who at a bare minimum know how to administer the test. And it is the high school diploma for a dog, in my opinion. Every family pet can at least be trained on it um, and could probably pass, uh, and especially if, if uh, you're training them for some high-end working stuff, service dog work, whatever it is, your dog needs to be able to smoke that test. They need to look at it, and it's, it's easy. And for those of you considering joining the service, they the uh, recruiters will also take an AKC certification in lieu of a high school diploma. Uh, word on the street is that's actually more valuable now, the AKC certification, than actually Four. graduating high school. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. I see. Right. That's a good joke. I was like, what? Oh, it's never good when the guy has to tell you. Yeah, that's a good that's joke. A good <laughs> I thought you were. I thought you were. I'm so used to. I'm not funny. No, I'm so used to people new in the industry confusing. I've heard GCG and I've heard all kinds of <laughs> you know people confuse things yeah. because of you know military acronyms yeah, all of over course. the place. And I was like, I think he means. <laughs> but I, I'm not a good interviewer. No, I need a new job. <laughs> no, so, you're good. So, um, you know, you have a nonprofit, you have Semper Canine. Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you've faced with the nonprofit that also has animals mixed into it. They always say in show business, ever work with kids or animals, and you've started a nonprofit. Uh, you have animals involved. I'm sure there's like some type of regulation or some IRS thing. Tell us a little bit about the challenges involved in your nonprofit uh, and where you are at now. So obviously when I, when we pilot program, are we able to do this, especially in this area? Is there a market for it? Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, number crunching involved, um, but really it comes down to past passion over uh, production. Um, I'm the executive director as well as the, the, the canine program manager for our organization, but I consider myself, uh, my main duty is quality control. You know, I want to make sure that the dogs that we produce are, they meet and exceed uh, minimal standards per obviously the, uh, the Department of Justice definition of a service dog. But, you know, being a Marine, um, you know, and of course we talk about being the subject matter expert of, you know, whatever uh, profession you're in. You want to, you know, I'm, I'm looking for breakout practices. I'm looking for things that, hey, can we create some standards that are above the minimal? Um, and when we pilot program this, we, we I was essentially afforded the opportunity to, hey, pick apart, you know, as many organizations that I can get in touch with, you know, try to figure out what's working for them, what's not, uh, and try to craft a model that will still stick to our mission, uh, but more importantly is going to provide that that quality product to the veteran or to the, to the owner. So, um, the challenge with it is a, hey, is it feasible? You know, can we afford to do it? Um, when we first started in 2014, uh, you know, that we had no intention of really doing more than three to six dogs, whatever I could handle, you know, on a part-time basis. Um, you know, I wanted to do it full time, but you know, it was, you know, I couldn't put my family's life and in, in risk at that, you know, just to, just to chase chase something that is not even really proven, mm -hmm. uh, but you fast forward five years and not only we've proven the model, we've we've expanded at least three times. Um, we currently are in the process of of built bulking up where we can do twenty four plus service dog teams a year, and somewhere in that twenty four to forty eight dogs each year range. Um, and the biggest challenge right now is the three commodities that I have to worry about are obviously the, the funds to be able to run it, um, the veterans to apply for those dogs and, you know, and handle those dogs. 
but as well as the dogs, you know. So, and out of all three of those, uh, the most important to me is the veterans. You know, there's, you know, I like to say if I'm doing my job correctly, I'm working myself out of a job. There should be, you know, we're in, almost in between conflicts right now, you know, so hopefully we'll have another 10 to 30 year gap between having a, an influx of injured veterans returning home. But um, because of the, the state of, you know, care that we, there, the number of veterans are actually increasing, you know, so you have more and more veterans that are running into, you know, um, doctors that are, that are willing to re- suggest a service dog. You got, um, the awareness of service dogs is becoming more, um, uh, available to, to injured veterans out there. And our understanding of non-traditional treatment as a whole, you know, has made, uh, has opened up avenues for veterans to choose, you know, service dogs or animal assisted therapy versus, you know, opioids or, or, you know, medication or, or anything like that. So the biggest challenge for us starting out, uh, was just how big we wanted to go and being able to control it. Um, you know, because it's a nonprofit, we have, you know, specific regula- regulations, um, you know, placed by the, the internal revenue service that we have to stick by, but I don't really concern myself too much with that. I'm not a numbers guy. I'm all about dogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I surrounded myself with a you know a team that um, is completely comprised of a veteran, uh, a veteran spouse, or direct dependent of a veteran. Meaning they, their parents served, and we got we have uh, members in our organization, our board of directors, and our board of advisors that so completely comprised of that, going back to Vietnam War to to, to New Dawn. So. Um, that was kind of a good framework that I, you know, that we established for the organization. Uh, going back to you know creating a good mission, you know, a mission statement that we can always stick to that is going to define our organization, you know, for the, the entire life of it. Uh, but really, it comes down, like I said, passion over over production. Um, you know, you've got to have drive. You know, if you know, if I I love doing what I do, um, I believe all of our volunteers. You know, everyone is involved in Cipricana. They they love what we do. They love seeing our veterans be successful. See them, you know, stand up there when six months ago they wouldn't get in front of a crowd, and now they're, you know, ten minutes before that they're like, I'm not going to talk. And as soon as you put the spotlight on, they they spill their guts to the entire crowd, and that's what I love. Um, so my passion my passion is there, um, you know, and I try to control that that you know try to control the production to make sure I'm producing exactly what I should be. Uh, and that's really what it comes down to, I think, um, when you, if you're thinking about, you know, starting a nonprofit, um, specifically a service dog organization, you stick to it in the long haul because people are going to rely on you for, for the life of, you know, their life and their dog's life. You know, it's one thing to produce a good, you know, wheelchair for a veteran who could be, uh, benefit from it. But if there's no maintenance on that wheelchair, if he has no real way to operate it, if there's, a you know, you know, if there's a mistake with it or an incident or whatever, and they have nothing, it's, it's almost like you wasted your time. So, producing a you know a, a product that's going to stay in the test of time it goes a long way. But um, I think it's you need to think about uh, who who the the clients that you're serving, um, and making sure that hey, if I'm going to do this, that I I have to do it correctly. I have to do it all. I have to go all in. I can't just do one or two dogs and and get my feel good and. And that's it. You know, the passion has to be there. So where can we go to learn more about Semper Canine? Obviously our website, um, SemperCanine.org. Um, you know, if anybody's curious about the name, obviously there's that Marine Corps tie there. Um, the joke kind of comes that I couldn't escape the dog world. I'll always be canine. I'm kind of stuck here. Although I, I love being stuck here. Uh, but we're, we're really big on social media as well. I think across all platforms, Instagram, social media, I think that's, I don't know what all there are. Uh, Facebook, obviously, is probably one of our big, biggest ones. If you're interested in supporting Zipper Canine, um, you know, we're always looking for volunteers to help us with dogs, volunteers to help us with different projects and programs. Uh, but, you know, even just sharing our mission, whether it's a Facebook post, go into our website and sign up for our newsletter. You know, if you're local to Northern Virginia or interested in, in being involved, even from afar, you know, reach out to our, on our website, reach out to our team. And, We'll, uh, I'm sure we can find from some some way to use your 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 passion uh, to help us provide as many service dogs as we can for min- our injured veterans. Amazing, Chris! Thank you so much for taking time uh, and allowing me into your home 
to do this interview means a lot. I think that um, the service dog, I'm like I said, I'm a big fan of dogs. So I understand that connection that we have with our uh, our furry little friends. Uh, I've always said that while uh, you know my my time overseas in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, I felt bad for people, of course, but I always felt this like sadness for the stray dogs that are like just wandering and they're, you know, the dogs are caught in the middle of a war that they're, they're like, dude, I have no fight in this. Literally. I am a dog. Um, I always felt bad for them. Absolutely. Just sad for the dog. I mean, yeah, people are like, oh yeah, yeah, you're, you're a person, but this dog, <laughs> he's sad. Um, thank you for doing what you do. And, um, we need more people like you out in the world that, that actually take an interest in, the well-being of their fellow veterans. Um, you're doing good work, man. Thank you. No problem. I, I appreciate, uh, you know, here sharing our mission and, and what we do. And of course, keep up the good work. And um, I mean, of course, I, I love the opportunity to, to advocate, you know, for veterans and their, their challenges, but really it's their successes. I and mean, if that's yeah. what it takes for me to get it done, then I'm, I'll do it. One last um, huge shout out, huge thank you to your wife who has been wrangling the child in the background. You probably heard the kiddo talk, uh, uh, yell out a little bit. I don't blame him. I mean, we 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 threw him in a room with mom. We're like, try to keep him quiet. Um, I would have been rebelling too. I would have been kicking the doors like, oh no, I'm going to be on this show. Um, so thank you to your wife. Thank you to your family. And um, folks, this is the After Action Review Podcast. Listen, every guest on this show is a veteran, a veteran business owner, a veteran uh nonprofit guy, or sometimes we have first responders. Sometimes we have, uh, you know, the, the, uh, dependents or the, the, the family, the spouse of, of, of a veteran, everybody, everybody on the show wants to get their message out there. And it is, you know, this platform that I, I tried to get their, their organization out there, a little bit of advertisement, a little bit of talking about what it is that they do. Folks, like, listen, subscribe, and share. This is the way that we can push these veteran businesses to the forefront of America. More people need to know about Semper Canine. More people need to know about Assault Forward. More people need to know about Warfighter Hemp. More people need to know about every single one of these veteran-owned businesses. Everybody talks about, I support veteran business. I love to hear that. And whenever I hear, I support veteran business, really, what do you have on you right now that was made from a veteran-owned business. What do you have on you right now that you purchased from a veteran-owned business? Uh, 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 okay. I'm wearing uh, my, it, it actually, this is a Marine company, um, Zero Foxtrot. I there love their go. freaking hoodies, man. Uh, hey, Zero Foxtrot, get on the show. I've been trying to get hold of you. I'm going to get you final. I'm I a, love hoodies, by the way. Right? Right? I got a bunch of them. I'm a hoodie guy, so I wear them all the time. Uh, Zero Foxtrot, veteran-owned company. Uh, this is, it, it's so important to support veteran owned companies. And like I always tell folks, fine, you don't buy. Maybe there's nothing a veteran owned company that you can think of. There's tons, but you can't think of one that that sells something that you want to buy. That's fine. Go to a vet owned company's website. Go to their social media. Give them a like and give them a follow. Those things matter. A lot of people say, what do likes matter? They do matter because when you have to go in front of a board or um, when you have to go look for sponsorships for a nonprofit, one of those questions can often be, what does your social media look like? How many followers do you have? How many people are listening to your message? Because I'm going to donate money to you. I want to make sure that it's going to uh, the right cause and that enough people will see my sponsorship. So when you actually like something and you follow it on Facebook, uh, tw uh, Twitter, Instagram, you're helping out, not as much as buying something, but you are helping out. So make sure that you're helping by purchasing, donating, and at the very least, liking stuff. And just so you know, when you like the After Action Review podcast, you're pretty much liking all these businesses, right? Boom, force multiplier. All right, folks, that does it for me. Happy New Year. Uh, it's good to hear. It's good to see and hear uh, everybody on the other end of 2018. And um, for us, we're about to go enjoy the uh, the start of 2019. So, uh, future Rod, if you're listening, uh, this was a good episode, and I uh, hope you're doing good in the future of 2019. Ooh, I wonder if robots took over yet. Maybe, maybe. I'm excited. I'm excited, uh, right? We'll see.
Well, it's just something else. Just fast. Ugh. See, leave, I know the Marines thinking, I want robots just so I can shoot them. Yeah, well, I, a change of pace. I mean, I'm always hoping for the zombie apocalypse. I know, right? I, I, I feel like every day I wake up being like, dang it. Okay, so before <laughs> before we wrap it up, working dog, military dog versus zombie apocalypse, how are they going to do? I've, I've actually read a couple of books. Uh, there's a couple of books out there that kind of use dogs to, to, to knock down zombies. Obviously, they can't like bite them and attack them. But um, I don't – I think the feasibility, it, more of an alarm system than anything. Mm. Um, but I definitely like the idea of so, some kind of harness that will trip up zombies where your dog like will it. run in their feet and just pile them up. You know? I liked your 800-pound dog yeah, that you mentioned slip. earlier. Yeah. That, that was a good slip though because I thought of like an 800-pound dog like – that's a that's a lot of that's, that's a, a lot, lot of dog, dog food. That's a lot of dog. <laughs> that's a big old pile of poop. Too. Ooh, I don't. You need a you need a, a dinosaur a big poop. old pooper scooper for that one. <laughs> All right, folks, that does it for us. I'll see you at the next episode. That's pretty good. That's I want to feel like I was too serious. Too.